Today, dear viewer, this roll and ramble will not feature my face, but instead will feature the road in front of me, as we've missed way too many sunsets when I've done these, and frankly, I think that a sunset looks a lot better than I do. I have something interesting for you today. It's my thoughts on the changing, uh, the takeover, if you will, of the, uh, well, I guess you could say the whole IT industry, the whole the whole tech bro department. Um, over the years, we have seen an influx of a lot of people into tech that are very different from the stereotypical tech bro nerd of the 80s and 90s. We've seen people come in that were not the same as your typical nerd that probably didn't come into it for the same reasons, and we have seen the end result. I think that it's about time that we go over where we came from and where we are now, and what I think is the sinister underlying social motivation for that change. First of all, where did we come from? I was born in the 1980s, uh, somewhere around the early 80s, in fact. I was not, um, obviously I was not able to get in on any of the early boom in personal computing, what with being an infant and all, but I've basically been in front of a computer in various capacities, enjoying computers, enjoying learning to code in basic on a Commodore 64 since I was a child, a, uh, a, a somewhat young child, uh, I think around seven or so. And I've watched as what I started on um, grew into something that basically took over the world. Um, there was no internet to normal people when I was a kid. The internet existed, but for the purposes of any, like, any sort of grander social interaction, the internet did not exist. In the 80s, um, there were no web browsers because literally web browsers were not invented yet. Um, the browser called World Wide Web would not come along until, I think, 1991. So there was no web at all. The www, the HTTP, all that stuff didn't exist. The closest thing you could get to it was a protocol called Gopher. <clears throat> but even then, the internet was something that largely remained in use in universities and military facilities. It's not something that you got to touch at home. But what you did get to touch at home was a Commodore 64 or a Commodore Amiga, um, an Atari. Uh, they had a bunch of different Ataris, 400, 800, and then the 16-bit STs. Um, th there were a lot of different computers. And I speak from a United States perspective, so what I perceived is different than what you might have. I know that there are other computers out there, like in Japan, the MSX, um, in Europe, uh, there were a bunch of weird European computers. I know the Sinclair ZX81, or ZX81, as they like to say across the pond. Uh, I'm aware of a lot of computers. The Apple II, a legendary machine that was in every computer lab in every school that I ever went to until Macintoshes took over. We start with the personal computer, but with almost no connectivity. This is the era of the bulletin board system, the dial-up, extremely slow communication, um, text-based interaction, where mostly it's people calling in, maybe leaving messages for other users or reading posts, and then hanging up. Uh, BBS systems were a lot more like mailboxes than they were like any kind of interactive chat. And while you could chat, it mostly consisted of leaving a message and reading the messages left for you and walking away, lather, rinse, repeat. And I had access to none of it growing up. But I had access to a computer, the computer's manual, and lessons on how to program in a language called BASIC which is actually a pretty good introductory language as far as just being easy to understand. And when you have the computer-specific aspects of BASIC nailed down for the machine of your choice, you can do some pretty cool things. I mean, you can actually do some really impressive things. I was doing things with code when I was nine that 
actually impressed. Uh, I, I remember a relative of mine who used the same computers and they were almost shocked that I could do some of the things that I showed them I could do just writing code from scratch. <clears throat> But back in the 80s, with no internet and with BBSs, which, by the way, making a phone call further than about 10 miles from your residence cost money back then. A long time ago, any phone call cost money, but in this case, you would usually have to pay more money the further out your phone call was. The concept of a long-distance phone call basically doesn't exist anymore today. But back in the day, a long-distance phone call it costs some money. If you were dialing anywhere outside of your area code, you could expect to pay quite a bit per minute just to do that. So dialing up to a BBS, while it seems cool and interesting, make no mistake, it was not cheap. You wanted a sunset, here's your sunset, and it's a pretty good one. Hope you're happy. In the days of the BBS, if you wanted to do something with a computer, you pretty much had to have it right there in front of you. Everything was local, everything was simple, and the only people who wrote computer programs were people who got their hands on a manual, gave it a try for a little while, got it to print out funny sentences over and over, uh, and, and you know, that's about it. They didn't get very far. They scratched the surface of make the computer do a thing that you choose. Oh, hey, isn't that pretty cool and interesting? Wow, I, I am enjoying this. And that was the end of it. It was cool and interesting, but beyond a simple thing that it just wasn't interesting enough for most people to even continue. Coding is hard. Even in a simple language on a simple 8-bit machine that makes everything pretty simple, gentle, easy, boots right up into the programming language of choice, there's no compilation, there's no file system, you know, it, it's a very, very simple setup. It's, it's not enjoyable unless it's something that you find you enjoy. And a lot of people don't enjoy coding. I don't begrudge them this lack of enjoyment. It is not for everyone. You have to have a pretty specific mindset to enjoy that type of problem solving. It is a mindset that tends to be far more prevalent amongst men and particularly, particularly tends to be far more prevalent against a certain kind of man who has a certain mindset. <clears throat> In the past, we called these people nerds or geeks even. I don't really know the full difference between nerd, geek, and dork, but take your pick. The bottom line is nerd, geek, whatever you call it, computer nerd, computer geek, the type of usually male, usually a little bit further up on the bell curve from IQ 100 mind that enjoyed this sort of analytical thinking, logic, problem solving of that sort would fall into this stuff and stick with it. <clears throat> at first, it would be useless. It would just be a little fun hobby. Ha ha, look at what I can make the computer do. Isn't that amusing? I, am I not just having fun? And then it could escalate because you had the potential back in the day to make your own computer games. You could make your own games. One person could easily make a computer game. Whether they made a good game or not, it depends on how long they stuck with it and how far they got into learning. But one person in a few months could make a competent, enjoyable, marketable computer video game. We are far from those times, although we've never had more access to that. The market is so saturated that it's hard to make a game that stands out enough to be of value. Computers don't work the same way anymore, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The whole point of setting this stage of the way things used to be is to see what happened afterwards. So the computer nerd, the computer geek, even the computer dork, probably also a comic book nerd, geek, or dork. There are a lot of different possibilities here, but the kind of person, usually male, usually not super social, that tends to grab onto a hobby that's got some kind of analytical element to it and fixate on it. That's who would land here. And those are the people, for a very long time, 
that made the entire world of computers run. It's not that women were excluded. It's not that any given person was excluded, but they naturally excluded themselves. And I think that this is a distinction in our modern day and age where everybody makes everything so black and white, so one or zero, no gray area, no understanding, just everything has to be one way or the other or my brain doesn't know how to understand it. The, the way that we understand things today is very black and white thinking, but that's not how it works. People drift toward things they like. <clears throat> While it is true that you cannot drift toward a thing that you're not given access to, and thus giving more people access to more options can lead to more people liking things like computer programming. How can you get into computer programming if you have no computer that you can access or you have no programming reference materials to start from if you have no educational materials to begin your journey? And often the argument kind of stops there at this notion that people just don't have access to do this. But the thing is, that's not been that way for a long time either. Rewind. The 80s. Uh, in the 80s, I wasn't programming. But in the 80s, computers were pretty firmly... that You basically just had nerds all over the place, and that's it. Of course you had your marketing people. Of course you had your sales reps. But in the end, it was always the nerds, the people who were just absolutely absorbed and obsessed with computerdom in all its facets, that loved technology, that loved solving problems, the kind of people who would get excited when they found a way to take a 1,000 clock cycle subroutine that was called really frequently and shave it down to 900 clock cycles so that it would fit within, and this is just a theoretical example, so that it would fit inside a vertical blanking interval or whatever. This is the kind of person that everything in computers was centered around, built upon. You did not have people writing computer software that didn't really want to write computer software. They cared. They cared a lot. It was rare to find someone who went into computer programming for the money or the clout because the clout you would get is being labeled a nerd geek dork for the rest of your life and shunned by a lot of different popular social groups as a result. And the money? Well, the money was, I mean, it was like any other job. You know, computer programming is a bit specialty, but it, it wasn't the way it is today with all the systems to the point that we've exhausted the 4 billion IP version 4 addresses. You know, there's so many systems now that programmers you almost need an endless supply to keep up, or at least it feels that way. But back in the 80s, no, nowhere near. You had a personal computer boom, but computers were still out of reach to a lot of people. Mainframes were only still something that you get access to if you were a large corporation, and even a medium-sized corporation, but a mainframe took up a room. A mainframe used giant tapes for storage. A hard drive was measured in tens of megabytes. Even a hard drive that filled up an entire desk would not be even half a gigabyte was a pipe dream back then. Everything, very expensive, used tons of power, access was limited. And because access was so limited and because it was not something that any normal person would want to do, why would you want to sit in front of a calculator all day? I mean, it's basically just a giant fancy calculator. The only people that got into it were the people who went through this sort of hazing ritual of having to figure things out for themselves. You sort of proved yourself just by being there because to get there, you had to go through all of these really high barriers to learn everything. But over time, what occurred is that it started to become cool programming started to gain clout. In the 90s, you started to see the internet seep into people's homes. Then you started to see the World Wide Web infiltrate everything. The dot-com thing became a household name. Blah, 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 dot-com. Everything was dot-com. You know, yeah, you, back in the day, you had Alta Vista, Yahoo, Lycos, Google eventually came around. Uh, hot, there was Hotbot. Um, God, I can't name all the search engines, but there were so many of them even back then because 
behind the scenes at universities, people were building search engines like crazy when the World Wide Web came out. But by the late 90s, you had oodles of them, Googles of them even. <clears throat> and once the internet started to become a staple in American homes or homes worldwide, just once so many normal people got access to the internet, they could start accessing materials that previously were just shared among researchers and university people. They could start sharing knowledge and information. And you started to see computers in general become more of a so-called normie thing. America Online, for a very long time, AOL, was considered to be the, uh, the entry point for most of the really, like just the worst of the worst normies to get on the internet and in chat rooms and all this other stuff, basically to get connected to, to, to other people and then to just shit up that connection with their normie dumb. <clears throat> AOL made it almost seamless for an idiot to throw a disk in their computer and set up dial-up to call up to an AOL um, access point and just get on the internet and get up with other people and what happens when you lower the barrier to entry? Well, more people can enter. But when more people can enter, that means that more stupid people can enter. More people who don't understand something can enter. And I'm not saying that the people that came onto the internet back in the late 90s, that all these, this flood of new, relatively normal people, you know, you could argue myself included, and I'm not saying that it was necessarily bad. And frankly, you know, I'm not saying that I was some sort of genius that just magically knew everything. But as the bar was lowered, you let more and more fools get on the internet who didn't understand things, who didn't think about things like, no, wait a minute, <clears throat> if I post to this forum, then anybody else in the world that can get on the internet can read what I wrote. There's no shortage of people who just wouldn't even think that far, that, that never would have even crossed their minds. Um, things like, you know, um, the earlier days of like uh, child predation on the internet, um, the infamous Yahoo chat rooms with just filled with people looking for 12 year olds to uh, do bad things to. I mean, there was even an episode of Degrassi, the, uh, the high school drama show back in the day. I think the first episode of it, uh, which I didn't watch, but I found out later um, that this episode was, um, the first episode was about predators on the internet. It's like, wow, you're coming, you're coming in hot, aren't you, boy? As normal drooling idiots could get on the internet, normal drooling idiots could be normal drooling idiots on the internet. And what did they do? They promptly got on the internet and drooled all over it. Um, you started having more and more bad behavior on the internet. And more and more people could get introduced to information from other parts of the country. And some of that information was about tech jobs. Hey man, you, you know how much money you can make if you get into computer programming? Like look at these salaries. Look at, look at how much money these people make. Like, oh wow, people doing computers, they make a decent amount of money, I'll go into that. And as you saw this, this boom of dot coms and of online services and websites, forums, e-commerce started to be a thing, eBay came around, you know, as, as this boom hit and the demand for people who could handle the infrastructure and the coding and all that went up, salaries went up because the way that the market works is if you have high demand then and you have low supply then the salaries go boom and just straight to the moon suddenly it was worth a lot of money if you could dick around with computers and do it well <laughs> or even middling um, the dot-com boom you really it, it's hard to explain I mean I wasn't a full-fledged adult at the time of the dot-com boom and it was difficult for me uh, to fully understand it, but even just in the early 2000s, looking back on the 1999 dot-com bubble burst, it was shocking, just amazing how much the tech companies were valued to the point that 
anybody looking back today is like, how did that even happen? But it's true. There was this, it was sort of an inflation of technology. Like everything's going to be online. Programmers were hired like crazy. You know, system administrators hired like crazy. Technical writers hired like crazy because back then you still had to distribute software as if the software you distributed, the manuals you put out with it, and so on would be the last version that that person would ever get and they had to be self-sufficient. And this is where you start to see what I'm really talking about today come into play. Yeah, 24 minutes or whatever into this. I don't know. Depends on how I edit it. In the 90s, as the internet became the thing, and as everything started to boom, you started to see people come into programming and they flooded out all of the really competent people that had been selected due to the high barrier to entry. And you saw middling programmers, administrators and such replace these guys. Because now everything's just going boom. Everything's gonna be on the internet. Everything's gonna, you know, the, the information superhighway was the term that they used back then. So there was this rush, this gold rush to monetize technology and unfortunately, when you try to monetize technology, um, you can go overboard very easily because the promise is not known and you see rapid initial growth. Ergo, hey, if this growth keeps up, then we're going to make infinite money. And that's just not how it works. Software was written in the 90s. It was written, it was tested, it was packaged on disks with manuals, huge manuals, manuals that were 900 pages put in boxes and shipped to customers physically. <clears throat> no one had internet access. Just no one. No one had internet. You could not create software and assume that everyone had access to the internet or even most people. Dial-up was still the main method of internet access for the vast majority of people in the year 2001. Even when XP came out in 02, dial-up was huge. So software had to be very thoroughly tested, and it was. Software was created, tested, overseen, etc., by people who had passion for what they did and by people who really knew what they were doing because they had to clear all those extreme barriers to entry to get there in the first place. So you've got people who are personally invested. We're talking the Commodore team, for example, when they would do some of the Amiga engineering things, they would sleep in sleeping bags in their offices so that they could spend more time working to rush things out and have it fully tested and so on. These people cared extremely about what they did. And they knew that once the product was packed and shipped, that was the end. There was nothing like today where you can just send out a bug fix over the internet and expect that every customer can do it. There wasn't crap like where you distribute a game and when you get the game in your computer or your game system or whatever, all that that disc has on it is a stub that downloads the whole actual game, several gigabytes of game, and there's no actual game on the disc. You can't pull that crap back in the late 90s. It's just not possible. But the people cared a lot. They debugged relentlessly. Whole teams of people who gave a massive shit about what they were doing had immense, almost absurd, impossible to even fathom pride in what they did, pride in the end product that they were trying to produce. You had these people and it just, it doesn't exist now because over time as tech, as tech salaries bloated tremendously, as the market was flooded with people who went to school, who got certificates and certifications <clears throat> so that they could get into tech. Because look at all that money over there. All of a sudden, tech people make a lot of money. All of a sudden, if you're in tech, you must be rich. And of course, if you're rich, you can support a lot of women or whatever, you know? So people who wanna get rich go into tech. They don't give a shit about programming. They don't give a shit about code quality. All they give a shit about is look at all that money I'm leaving on the table by not getting, and by not minimally qualifying for a computer science degree or getting eight CompTIA certifications or whatever. Look at all that money I'm leaving on the table 
by not going out and getting credentials and getting that job. I want that job. The, these programmer guys make 80k a year, and it's either that or I continue. I can go into some other professional field for 35k a year. Look at all that money. And so all of the all of the Chads and Stacys, they saw all that money and they were like, man, there's a bunch of money over here. We've got to go get some of that money for ourselves. So the Stacys show up. The Karens show up even, the feminazi Karens show up, all of them are like, hey, we're women, you're all men. We just want to be included in what you're doing because it makes a lot of money. We just want to be included. And then the Chads show up and they're like, hey, hey, look, <clears throat> there's a bunch of socially stupid dudes and a lot of money to be made for me and there's some hot chicks that are over here because they can smell the money. What? Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and join up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and get some of that money and some of that pussy, cause I'm a Chad, and that's what I do. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna get me some money and some pussy. I'm gonna be a tech bro, and make some money and some pussy. And there you go. That's basically what happens. It happens in all kinds of things, mostly predominantly male. Um, hobbies. Uh, I, I don't like to use the phrase, the word spaces because I think it's bullshit. Uh, but pr male hobbies, you know, a lot of these programmers, the programming was their hobby. Their job was their hobby. They loved what they did so much. And they had so much pride in what they did. Only for these people to show up and shit up all the hard work they did with their, their barely qualified, um, <clears throat> not caring, why do companies go downhill? Because, I mean, obviously you've got every Tom, Dick, and Harry trying to come in and make all that money and get all that clout that comes with it, drive that Beamer, or these days that Tesla. Look at me, I got a Tesla. I must have a huge penis and a lot of money in my bank account, you know, which is kind of how some people treat it. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's all about that clout. So you start out with the people who care a few people show up who also are interested in the same thing and are genuine and so on. Then, when some people who are not interested but they see all this this stuff that you've got going on, that they can see that, hey, you know, there's something about this group that I like, you know, they, they come in too and they, they just kind of, you know, maybe they're not there for the most honest intentions and then other people see them and are like, hey, I can do that too. And next thing you know, most of the original people who gave a shit are gone because they've left because all the Chads and Stacys that showed up just to party and do all this other crap, you know, or even like, let's say uh, outsourcing, you know, people from other countries showed up. <clears throat> people from other countries would come in and be like, hey, you know, this, this tech, uh, all, the, all these tech jobs out there, would love to hire us for less money than the people that actually live in the countries that we're going to. And this continues to happen this day, by the way. They'll hire us for less money. All we have to do is make up fake credentials at a fake university we call in or whatever, and, and we can show that we're credentialed, and oh, I can't find any Americans at all that'll, buy, that'll do the jobs. So hire the third worlders to come in for less money. So now you've got Chad, Stacy, and um, uh, I don't know, uh, let's just say John, because every call center that ever called someone and tried to scam them out of money, their name is always John, right? So Chad, Stacy, and John are here. Uh, Stacy came and shit it up because she saw a bunch of guys having fun and was like, hey, look at all these guys. Look at all these guys with money or whatever. I want in on that. And then Chad's like, look, at, look women, I want in on that. And, and then John over here is like, look, uh, people making a bunch of money and an opportunity for me to get out of this hole that I live in and get a better life over there. So I'll come in and maybe some Chads and Stacys get fired and get mad, but not enough of them. And that's how you get modern tech. People come in that don't care. They're not here because they like what's going on. They, they're not here because they enjoy tech. They're here because the money. They're here because they get something out of it, but they don't give a shit about it. So they do a shitty job because that's what you do when you don't care. When you don't care, you don't do a good job. You do what you need to do 
to make sure that you can stay where you are and continue to milk that cow, but you don't do a good job. Most people in tech today do not do a good job. Most people in tech today are worthless, they are drains, they are liabilities, they are cancer for the company that they work for. But because of the way the bureaucracies work and because of the way the ass-kissing socializing works, the people who actually care tend to be the first ones to be chased off or fired or whatever. Because once Stacy gets in there, she would love to boink Chad, but she would not love to boink Poindexter over here that knows how everything works. But ew, oh, he's an IT nerd, ew. He might have money, but she's got money now because she shoehorned her way in. She's got, what is it, like bamboo towels and recycled trees in the lobby and, and orange water and all that crap. If she's living this comfy life, siphoning all the perks off of this cushy tech job, you know, and she's got access to the chads that show up, <clears throat> but all the poindexters that know what's going on, she gets rid of them. How does she get rid of them? Well, I mean, we don't want all these creepy guys around. We don't want autistic men near us. We don't want ADHD men near us. <clears throat> we don't want men that have social anxiety or social disability around us because they're creepy. They're creepy. They don't conform to what we want. They, they, they let, we need to get rid of these freako weirdos that, that are not the same as us. By the way, we love neurodivergent people. We're all about equality, diversity, equity, inclusion, right? But you got to get rid of these men. You got to get rid of these autistic men. You got to get rid of any man that sticks his head up and says, I'm not going to do what you say just because you're a woman. Oh, no, he's a rapist. You got to fire him. Oh, stack the HR department with women. Get a, get a feminist on the HR department, and she can get the rest of the HR department to go away and bring on more women that are there because they got somehow got a degree that puts them in HR instead of doing something that is actually valuable with their lives. You get the idea. You get enough of these people that don't give a shit about what you're actually trying to do at some company or with some project together, and they take over and they send all the people away that originally did it. They, they milk the thing to put their mark on it so that they can use it as a line item on a resume or to look cool when they say, hey, I work for Disney, I shit up Star Wars or I work at Google. I stop hatred on the internet by getting Kiwi Farms banned off the internet for saying things about me that I don't like. They didn't break any laws, of course. They haven't done anything that violates the terms of service at their internet service providers. But, you know, <clears throat> if Google leans on um, a smaller internet connectivity provider with their muscle and their threats and such, and you get a call from a higher up at Google saying, hey, you're going to do this or we're going to we're gonna hurt you, well, what are you supposed to do? Oh, we got to find some reason to boot the farms off, man. This is where we are today. The business of technology has become a dystopia run by chads. And actually, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, there is a third kind of person. There is, um, often they're referred to by the Kiwi Farm people as troons. or the 4chan people, too. Um which is someone who claims to be trans and who does like this minimal like, oh, I've got long, long hair that I colored purple now and I, and I wear um, a shirt from the women's section at Target. <clears throat> I am now a woman. I'm, de I'm, I'm definitely not, you know, just doing that so that I can wield the power that society assigns to that. Yeah, so, I mean, and that's, that's sort of the bizarro evolution of the dystopia that we found ourselves in 10 years ago. 10 years ago, tech, you were seeing replacement of all of the pesky, socially inept men that just happened to be really good at what they did and knew what they were doing with women and people who were there just for clout. It's, it, it's basically we're watching the corpses be looted today. That's all there is to it. We're watching the looting of the corpses of major technology, projects, businesses, all of it. It's all a mass corpse looting. 
And because of the fact that there's now, like if you look at a picture, what was it, Ubisoft, I think, if you go look at the Ubisoft then and now, there's like Ubisoft like 15 years ago, and it's absurdly diverse. Like there's there's white, brown, black, you name it, people. Uh, people from, of every persuasion. And even a few women sprinkled in there. Not many women, because like I said, women tend to not prefer tech until they find out that they can make a whole lot of money and have a whole lot of power and control over people if they go into tech. That There's all this clout to be had. There's status. Status makes a lot of toxic people show up and shit up the place. And women are not an exception to that. Women are an exception to having to do bullshit analytical jobs that can be really brutal and, and hurt your freaking brain, you know, leaving you up till three in the morning trying to solve some problem that you would rather have just gone to bed a long time ago and there's nobody here to talk to. Women don't want to do that. We can almost argue that they're smarter for not wanting to do that. Women don't want to do that, but they'll show up for some clout and money. They'll show up for orange water and free food all day and this cushy job where they, they can manage to reduce their actual work to like 30 minutes a day and the rest of it is socializing, eating nice food, having nice things, and posting on the internet about how great they are, how wonderful their life is, you know. Eight years later, they'll be posting about how they're sad because they can't find a man and all this other crap. But hey man, they're living it up at the tech company. They got the clout. So because there's all these women already there, women basically run everything. White liberal women, in fact. It's, it's all white leftist females that seem to run everything in tech now. Have you noticed that? Like if you look at Huffington Post, there was that picture of the board for Huffington Post, and it was all white women, all white liberal women. White liberal women run everything. You want to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Why are you letting all these white leftist women run everything? There aren't brown people running everything. It's, there aren't brown men. You know, it's all white leftist women. And if you're not in that group, they have managed to make sure that you will stay out. The problem is there's not very much overlap. If you draw a Venn diagram <clears throat> of any given set of identities, you're going to find that white liberal women and people who actually understand this complicated programming shit, there's not very much overlap in those two sets. We are living in a, in, in a world run by multinational billion dollar tech conglomerates run by white, liberal, extremely privileged women who sit on the board of directors or are even CEOs of companies like Sweet Baby Inc., that, that company that people have learned is notorious for ruining gaming. Yeah, yeah, the CEO of that company claims that they are a marginalized victim. You're not a victim. You're not a victim. You are literally at the highest position possible in a multinational corporation that rakes in millions or even billions of dollars a year. You are not a victim. You are not marginalized. You literally run the fucking show. What is marginalized about you? What, what is even remote? Why should I give two shits about the fact that you had to read something on the internet that wasn't 100% nice to you? Why do I care? You are on the highest of the high horses, looking down, going, I am a slave. No. No, we are living in a world that for years and years has been run by these people who don't give a shit about the things whose corpses they are looting. And then the people who look at that and go, hey, I want some of that, but there's already women and there's already a bunch of black people and so on in there. How can I get in? I'm a white man. Well, all I have to do is, is pretend to be trans woman. And now all of a sudden I am by some strange reason, I am the highest victim. I am the most victimized person in the society. Ergo, for some reason, I also have the most power, despite somehow being the greatest victim. That somehow gives me the greatest power. So that, if you've ever wondered why things are the way they are, this is why they are the way they are. Because all of these, all of these things, gaming, technology, I mean, even like board games, you know, tabletop RPGs, 
all of these things that were traditionally occupied by male nerds that nobody wanted to socialize with, that everybody thought was weird, and it was the one place that they could go. And, the, and, and even gyms, like even gyms today, their gym bros are just nerds of a different stripe. Even gyms today are absolutely infiltrated with women filming, pretending like the men in the gyms are predators for looking at them when they are filming the men and, while filming their asses to make money on OnlyFans. So even, you can't even go to the gym and escape the women that show up and try to exploit the, the traditionally male space for clout, for money, they don't care about the actual reason that you go to the gym to be fit. They don't care. They're not there for that. They're there to take the perfect picture of the curvature of their butt. And if some guy happens to be in the background face unlocking his phone, did you see that rapey Predator McPredator pants? Oh, he took a picture of my ass when he thought I wasn't looking, but my phone that I'm using to record him right now Somehow it's not okay for him to take a picture of my ass while I'm recording my ass for the whole internet to see. Everything is a corpse. All of technology, all, everything that you could call a male space is a corpse being looted by women and by opportunistic men, spineless, scummy con men that are there to get the bucks they can to, to milk that corpse, to loot that corpse, to sell the bones. We're living in the corpse of tech. That's how you get Windows 10. That's how you get Windows 11, especially. That's how you get websites that have hamburger menus. Uh, if you hate UI design today, guess what? Go look at the people that are designing those UIs. Go look at the people that write all this software you hate. But you know what? Go look at software made by a smaller company. Go look at, look at a company that makes niche software, that makes industry specific, <clears throat> like say trust software. Um, I worked with a trust company once, and uh, not like directly, but I helped them with their computer problems. And they showed me the software they use. And the software they use is just some trust program. It just does a specialty thing made just for the creation um, of trusses for houses. And I looked at the software and I'm like, I can immediately tell, A, this software is quite old, like it was originally created in like the early 2000s maybe. B, this software hasn't changed that much since the early 2000s, like they haven't made major interface changes. Uh, but C, I can see how highly functional this software is just by watching you work with it the guy was lightning with this software and that's the problem if you get a bunch of people in design fields which are frankly design is not a male dominated field anything having to do with arts tends to be more female dominated and more social so you see that and all these people get in design. Well, they've got to justify their jobs, which means they have to keep redesigning stuff just to stay in their positions. And they've got this team of HR people that makes damn sure they stay in their positions. They might even have a union that does. But their flanks are guarded from ever being kicked out of their positions. They're, they're high-end tech jobs. That's why everything has gone to shit. I know we can talk about how everything has gone to shit. We can talk about how bad Windows 11 is, how everything tracks you, how everything's a subscription. But the bottom line is none of that matters until you address the core problem. I'm, I would love to talk about the symptoms and document them, but the core problem in the end is that you have these people looting the corpses of what used to be tech. And until you get rid of them and bring back in competent people, replace them with people that actually know what they're doing and care about what they're doing, it's just going to continue to be garbage. Everything's going to suck until you get rid of them. Kill these big corporations, and that's it. Thanks for listening. Like, comment, subscribe. You know the drill. Have a good one.